12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The third book Jesus wrote with a red ink pen. John 12. Are you comfortable? Not in this house. Don't get comfortable in here. We got a, we, we're coming up on the end of this month. It's moving. This year's rolling, man. We're hitting April. When we hit April, April the 1st, we got a car show we're going to be going to uh, over here at the Crosby Fairgrounds in order to promote our own car show. It's a little incognito stuff with some, with some really tough-looking cars. We've got some of the finest cars uh, literally in Texas that we'll be showing up with. And then uh, and Ken Holloway is going to be there with his band. He's going to be in church with us on Sunday. Uh, so we're going to have a good time there. Who knows? We might even get Ronnie Millsap to show up Sunday. You know, I, I don't know. We, we always try for, other, for things like that. Then we hit that, and then we got a conference with Tony Miller is going to be here with us, and we're going to rock with Tony and work with him. And uh, So there will be a special night there. Then we're going to hit Easter. We're going to have a special Easter service here on Saturday night, an overflow service. So those of you that went off on all day on Sunday, you can be here on that Saturday night at 6 o'clock. And then, uh, then we're going to keep on going. And then the 30th, boom, what are we going to do? Muscle Car Sunday. So uh, uh, it's just, Charlie, it ain't going to slow down. So, so put on your seatbelt, prepare yourself. You can rest in, let's see, March, April, May. You can rest in May. On May. Well, I, I don't see no rest till the end of August, to be honest with you, if you saw our schedule. This week's been crazy. Not only have we dealt with uh, my son's accident, but then, you know, we – Thursday night, David and I and Josiah, we had to run skinny dippers off the property. <laughs> they ran when we went down to the pool, so I took their clothes and hid them behind a tree. <laughs> Pulled my phone out and told them to come out the woods. I actually told them we were loaded, they better go, you know, so they, they, they ended up, they actually had enough clothes on to get out without us having to do anything else but you know you can't be down there swimming at 11 o'clock at night on somebody else's property you know that's just not especially with all of us with guns you know he said I thought y'all were the cops I said no we were we the owners <laughs> then we had the cops running all over the place Friday night looking for a woman who's lost in the woods I mean we've had so much stuff going on yesterday I was at the hospital with a man that got hit in the head with a mag light in a fight cracked his skull lost his sight in one eye you know, praying for them. So I'm so glad to be in church with y'all today. <laughs> to be around normal people that just have no troubles in life. Everything is smooth and easy. No sicknesses, no hurts, no ailments. Amen. What a wonderful group. John chapter 12, verse 20. We're moving close to the end of the life of Christ. And he says, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast of tabernacles. And the same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee. Philip, now you've got to pay attention to his name. And these Greeks said to him, Sir, we would see Jesus. Next. And Philip cometh and tell, told Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will also my father honor. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very, oh, oh. There you go. For this very hour, very reason, reason, I came to this hour. Go to the next. I said to you before, guys, that Jesus was not born. He was sent, just like us. We were sent to earth through our mother's wombs. God sent us here for a purpose and a reason to be here. When he got here, he finally came to the end where he said, okay, the, my reason for being here is fixing to happen. Then he said, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there said they heard thunder. Others said an angel spoke to them. And Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not for mine. In other words, I'm aware that God has affirmed me and validated me and given me permission to be here. But I want you guys to know that also. Now, the Message Bible says it like this. Next slide. There it is. There were some. We got a rookie in the back. We got all men in the booth, man. I've never seen all men back there. Woohoo! 
Uh, there were some Greeks in town who had come to worship at the feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee. They said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came to tell Jesus, and Jesus answered, Time's up. Everybody yell, Time's up. Time's up. You ever said that to your children? Time's up. It's over. Every game has an, e an ending to it. I've been watching March Madness. Uh, Derek, good to see you here from Tennessee. Where's that bride of yours at? Stick your head out. Hey, sis, good to see you. Uh, the, when I've been watching March Madness. Love a little basketball. Of course, I've been staying in there with my son, and so we've been watching it. And, I, man, when, it, when time's up, every now and then you get a little overtime. You get that last shot, you get a little extra time. But eventually that game's going to be over and time's going to be up. You have so much time here on this earth. And one day, that hourglass is going to hit. And when it does, your time's going to be up here. Everybody yell, time's up. time's up. So the thing is, you know, God spared my son Monday. He still has more time. But this week and last week, I had other friends that passed away. Their time was up. And I can mourn it, be sad over it, but I can tell you all of us, at one time or another, we're going to face the fact that the sand of this time, of this life, is going to run out. And when it does, it's what you've done here that matters. Because this here is going to be empty, the earth part, but the heaven's coming. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for your anointing, your blessing. Now, God, take this word and impart it to our heart. Let us leave here with, with persuasion and purpose within inside of us to do what we need to do with what little time we've got left here. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. This entire story happens here on Palm Sunday. It represents the beginning of the end, a determined time. Jesus said the hour's come. Time's up. Seven times John makes a reference to the hour. John paid attention to what Jesus said about the hour's coming. As a matter of fact, in John 2, 4, it says, Jesus said unto her, the woman at the well, what, what have I to do with you? Mine hour's not yet come. He knew that there was a time coming. John 7, verse 30, Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. Jesus knew that you couldn't even kill him. You couldn't take him out till his time's up. Now, I live with that same um, persuasion inside me. I ain't leaving this earth till God says my time is up. And whether that be on a, an accident or, or through a, a, a age, well, whatever takes me out, I'm going to say, all right, God, that's your call. But I'm going to stay as long as I can until time's I said time's and when it's up, it's up. I'm not going to fight with him because I see revelation and understanding in what Jesus is talking about. I mean, they tried to kill him. He just passed right on through. He walked through him. Why? Because he knew his hour had not come yet. The sand had not run out. John 8, 30. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him. Why? Because his hour was not yet come. John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this reason... I came. John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. You know, Jesus made some strong statements here that we struggle with. Giving up our own life. Uh, uh, i got to hate this life in order to love that life. I believe there's a balance to that because he said he came to give us life and life more abundantly. But it, it's for the believer to find that, that, that stress point, if you would, that, that balance point, that tension. Let's use the word tension in life. How much should I love this life and not hang on to it? And how much should I love the life I'm going to and to hang on to that? 17, 1 of John said, these words spake Jesus, lifted up his eyes to the heaven and said, Father, the hours come, glorify your son, that thy, your son also may glorify you. The word hour simply means a predetermined time. Had I known as a young man that I had a predetermined time, I think it would have changed a lot of my destiny. If I'd have understood that I only had so much time here. I lived for myself. I did my own thing. I, I didn't care about anybody else. I ran over other people. But, but, but to get into not just being born again, but to have a revelation and an understanding that I have a specific purpose, reason for being here, a determined time like Jesus did. Here come some Greeks to Jesus, and they said, Sir, we would see Jesus. How many know the world wants to see Jesus? I said uh, uh, Wednesday night I picked up a little song. I don't think I missed it Tuesday. But right now in England, they are in revival. 
The weirdest thing is taking place in England, not in England, just in England, but in Germany, uh, uh, Sweden, other places in Europe, because they have taken in so many Muslims. Matter of fact, over an, almost a million refugees have come in. Now, I'm not here to hear your slant on this, but I, I do want you to catch this. Many of those are turning to Jesus right now. And because of that, these dead churches that have been in Europe are starting to revitalize with all the Muslim believers coming in. That's a crazy thing. Everybody say crazy thing. You know, we want everybody to go to heaven except Muslims. Oh, I know you rednecks. I know how you think, what you're thinking, everything. You know, I, I, I pick up on it. And I struggle with some of it too. But I'm not going to stand back and say that only a Jew can make it to heaven. The Bible says Gentiles too. That means anybody that's outside of that can make it if they accept Christ. Now, some of them may have the wrong reason for doing it. I, I don't know their reasons, but I can tell you this. A lot of them knew they were being persecuted and slaughtered over in their other country, and now they're in a place of freedom, and they can come into a church like you got today, amen, and fill it up and worship God of their own choosing and serve Jesus who died for them. I think that's a powerful thing. So these Greeks came, and they said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Now, they, they were not a, a they, these were not Greek-speaking Jews. They were Gentiles. They were not just Greeks. They were curious Greeks. They were Greeks at a Hebrew feast. They were Greeks on a mission. They, they wanted to see Jesus, but, but, but they also just wanted to check him out. They were Greeks that were tired of philosophy. They were Greeks unsatisfied with mere Hebrew religion. When you study about Christ, you'll realize that he spoke to nationalities, that he dealt with them. Corinthians tells us this, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, which Jew and Greek or Gentile, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know, they were always Gentiles and Greeks coming to Jesus. At his birth, men from the east came. The woman at the table asking for crumbs. Remember the demon-possessed man from, from uh, the capitalist, the ten Greek cities? There he was. So their desire was displayed. The Jews were looking for a sign. I find a lot of people are looking for a sign. They're looking for miracles. They, they, that's what they chase after. That's what they were after. In John chapter 12, verse 9, Jesus said, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. They came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus, who had also been raised from the dead. They want to see miracles. I find that same spirit permeates the churches in America. We just want to see miracles and signs and signs and wonders. I understand that. That's a wonderful thing. But let me just mention to you again. In the life of David, David never saw a miracle. His whole, his whole life in ministry never saw it. He was a man seeking after what? Wisdom. His son was known as one of the wisest men in the world, Solomon. So here the Greeks were looking for him. They said, sir, we would see Jesus. They wanted truth. They were disappointed and disillusioned. They wanted something they had never found. I believe this is the millennial generation. They're looking for truth. They're looking for something they have never seen before. They're they listening to, sir, show us Jesus. And let me say this to you. They came to his disciples and said to the disciples, we want to see Jesus. Did you know that people are coming to you and they want to see Jesus and you've got to give them permission to see him? And you say, what are you saying, Pastor? They're looking through you to get to him. They look at you and say, okay, are you really a believer in Christ? Because if you are, then, then what I'm seeing, I want to know you, Jesus. Do people really want to know you, Jesus, by looking at you? Oh, that's a good question. You have to check yourself out in the mirror here as you're moving through life. So we decide today who's going to see him and who's not. This response was, if you want to see him, and then Jesus said, if you want to see me, you got to die for yourself, to yourself. John 12, 20, uh, 23, and Jesus answered him and said, the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. His perspective, he did not say die. He said, I'm going to be glorified. We always say die. Well, so-and-so died, you know, this one died. Jesus said, I'm not dying. I'm getting glorified. In other words, when this body goes into the ground, everything is fixing to change. When time runs out, I'm going to be. There was almost an excitement, if you could, about he, the, the pain, the hurt, the, all the things in the flesh. He knew that was going to be painful. That's why he said, let this cup pass from me. But on the other side, he looked at it as being glorified. He had a different perspective. His vision of the hour was positive, power, victorious. It was a great happening, and we may call it death, but Jesus called it victory. He literally mocked death. He said, death, you lost your sting. There ain't nothing to you now. Now, I know this is hard to get into humans. 
It's hard to get into us. I'm trying to get it into me first. I am not, I don't have a death wish like Charles Bronson. See, only the older folk knew that. My, my daughter, Jill, I was talking to her yesterday, and she said to me, she said, Pastor, I really need your help. I said, why is that? She said, who is the Fonz? <laughs> and I'm realizing I'm old. I said, oh, he was one cool dude back in the happy days. She, she, Jill didn't know. So it, it, we, we're necessary, older folk, to help this generation come up and but I have no death wish. I'm not, I'm not trying to leave here early. But when the sand runs out, I want to be gone, and I want to realize that it's not the end of anything. It's the beginning of something else. And I lived in such a way to die here to myself so that I can live there. Glorified means to render or esteem glorious. It's a manifested excellence. In other words, you may think you know me, but wait till you see me in heaven. Wait till I see you in heaven. It's going to be a manifested excellence. May our lives and our death bring him glory. Uh, Psalm 116, I use it all the time at funerals. I share it with others because I find it such a fascinating scripture. It actually says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Whew. That to us is sadness, it's heartache, it's hurtful. But yet to God, it's precious. It's something special that he's looking forward to, that this reunion, if you would. So his parable, he said, if you want to see me, you've you got to die to yourself. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, John 12, 24, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it, if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Death is the key to spiritual fruitfulness. you got to die to yourself. Apart from his death, his life stands in isolation with no power of increase. Had Jesus just been like any other prophet and died, that would have been one thing. But that resurrection changed everything. Yeah. Amen. He said, if you put me in the ground, everything's going to change. Amen. As a matter of fact, they didn't, they didn't bury Jesus. They planted him. Just like you'd put a seed in the ground. And in Genesis chapter uh, uh, 3, uh, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 1, it says that on the third day that there'd be seed time and harvest. So Jesus was not just one that was going. He literally went back to the, to the Genesis and says, I need three days. Just give me three days. If you give me three days, I can do this thing. Okay? But you've got to give me three days. Well, the disciples, they didn't want three days. They don't let that happen. See, before there's multiplication, there must be decomposition. The Bible always talks about us dying to ourselves. How many realize... Sister Laura and I were talking last night. She said, you know, we, we're talking about our, our, as you get older, come on, just be honest. We all, we all not going to have this body. <laughs> this body is sickening. This body can eat all day long and not gain no weight. I used to look like this body. Better looking face, but I look like this body. <laughs> And, and, and I've gotten older and, 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 and a little softer. And, and things break easier and, and they don't heal up as quick. And we were talking about that last night. She said, why do you think this is the way it is? It was at that late night talk. And I said, I said baby, listen, this, it's the old man. The old man keeps trying to rise up and eat anything he wants. The old man tries to rise up and drink anything he wants, say anything he wants. I had some criticism this week, and believe it or not, I do get some. And, and, and I had to decide how I was going to respond to it. The old man wanted to cuss. The old man wanted to say a few things. The old man wanted to use sign language. <laughs> the old man just keeps trying to. And I know, though, this is a part of dying to myself. Now, I know many of you think because you're born again and saved and you're going to heaven anyway, you can do whatever the hell you want, but that's not true. All right, you got, you got to put the old man down. you got to say, old man, old man. Even Bob Dylan has a song about old man, old man, when will you arise? Because he just keeps, he, it's like you think you've got him dead and buried, and he's good and gone. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, he come back up. And you, if your mouth starts saying something, you better catch that tongue real quick. Because you're going to say something you can't pull back in. Amen. Something going to live. So you've you got to live in such a, an anticipation of dying to yourself. Amen. Say, self, you can't do that. You can't get away with that. Go to the next slide there, brother man. Amen. And die. You got to die. So Jesus said, looked at him, and he said, you want to see me? You want to see me? Then you're going to have to go the same path I'm going. Amen. You're seeing me here in my flesh, but you want to see me in my glory. You've got to pass through the veil like I'm going to pass through it. 
Amen. You've got to die to yourself. Not only here, but you've got to prepare yourself for the next life. So as we move through life, we're going to have this tension all the time, just walking through life, that I want abundant life here, and it's okay to have it here. But you also need to know there's times to put down the dead man and say, dead man, you don't just get your way all the time. You mean, that's not going to happen. I'm here to serve the purpose of God in my generation. And when my time is up, when that sand runs out, I want to make sure that I'm sliding into heaven and it's going to be a glorious thing. If my perspective has changed, it ain't the end of anything. It's the beginning of another. Amen. And I won't have to fight with this dead man anymore. I won't have to wrestle with that devil anymore. I won't have to fight with, with, with people that are mean-spirited anymore. I won't have to deal with gossip anymore or criticism anymore or the lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Woo! It'll all be gone when I slide on into heaven. Amen. And die to myself. Lord, there, the whole body or substance of the grain, except the germ, dies in the earth or is decomposed. And the decomposed substance constitutes the first nourishment of the tender germ, a nutrient under, wonderfully adapted to it and fitted to nourish it until it becomes vigorously enough to derive its support entirely from the ground. What that literally says is something goes in the ground and rots. But the earth gives it nutrients and brings it back alive again. Man, you can plant asphalt over, a, over grass and weeds. And next thing you know, it'll shove its head right up through it. Ain't nothing going to keep you down. Amen. Yeah, they nailed him to the cross, put him in the ground, but they should have known you can't keep a good man down. Amen. He's coming back up. So in this, God shows his wisdom and goodness. No one thing could be more evidently fitted for another than this provision made in the grain itself for the future wants of the tender germ. Now, I stole all this from the dictionary, so it's kind of it's kind of beefy and messed up. But it's just to say this. Sometimes things look dead, and they look over. Sometimes people's lives look over. I, I look around in the wintertime, and I can't tell what a dead tree from a live tree. They all look gone to me. But then the sun comes back out and spring hits and then the buds come and the sap rises back up and, and next thing you know the tree's alive again. I give people opportunity to come back again. Amen. I, I believe in life again and we can move forward again. Jesus recoiled from this. A recoil means to back away from something, to, to pull back. There was a reaction that he had from this thing that was happening to him. As a matter of fact, he, he said, should I drink this cup, this cup? And uh, we've preached on this cup before of suffering. We, we don't have to go through the suffering he did. He did it for us. He said, now is my soul troubled. He said, this, this something inside me is troubled. He said, I, I, got, I feel a recall. The recall was in three areas, physically, spiritually, and mentally. Physical, the scourging, the cross was designed by wicked men. They were going to beat him. He knew it. They're going to pluck his beard. He knew it. They're going to spit on him and humiliate him. One thing that no man likes, you ladies may think we do, but we really don't, that's to be disrobed in front of others. I don't like taking group showers. Especially with skinny guys. <laughs> I don't want to be... We, we're careful in the restrooms. You know, you walk in the bathroom beside another man who's out of urinal, you slap him on the back, you'll shut him off just like that. He just. <laughs> you ladies, y'all ain't got to deal with that. They ain't nothing like getting a good flow going and somebody slap you on the back, boy. I'm telling you, ain't it right? Ain't you? Well, like that. So here at this moment, they take his clothes off. You know, guys. Jesus was naked on the cross. All your little pictures got a little cloth over him. He's naked. He's nude. They're shaming him. God took our shame so we don't have to be shamed. Shame never healed no one. So he took the shame for us. This, this, uh, the more I think of the cross, the more angry I get of what they did to him. So here he is physically. They beat him. They removed his clothing. They, they put him on the cross. Go back, go back, go back. Bro, stay with me. Mental. He knew of Judah's betrayal and Peter's denials and the disciples leaving him. Mentally, there ain't nothing like somebody betraying you, taking your confidence to hurt you. Here's, here's Peter, uh, excuse me, Judas betrayed him. Here's 
Peter denying him. I never knew him. Three years you with me? So he's recalling because he knows this is coming. This is something he sees in his future. This is a part of the, of the knowing that he's leaving. It's his hour. It's all part of that. Spiritually, he knew who he had no sin, and yet his father was going to turn his back on him. We call it the dregs, the bitterness of the cup. And he says at this moment, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew that God would turn his back from him not to look on the sins of the earth from the beginning of time, from Genesis poured forward, all the times of Noah and past all that, all those sins are going to be poured on him. And here he is naked on the cross, beat bloody. The only thing covering his body was the blood. And it's flowing over his body. He knew that was coming. This is the end. Amen. Come, come on up here, brother. Let's close with this. Stand with me. Now you can go next month. Then he submitted. For this cause came on to this hour. You got to find your cause before your hour runs out. You got to find it. You got to look for it. Right? The kindness is going to have something to do with the fruit of the Spirit love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, meekness. You got to find why you're here. The report yesterday when I went and prayed for this young man. I deal with rough families. I mean, my this is rough. They're rough. You're getting hit in the head with a mag light. You probably weren't wearing a tie. So I, I go in, and, man, they come out, and they're desperate. They're desperate. So I go in, and I pray with him, and this message is on my mind. He's 30 years old. Your time ain't up yet. It's a bump in the road. But when I see families that are hurting, I, I realize how many times we just move through life, work, our, work, 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 and then we die. But if I can get to a place in my life that my work is a part of my ministry, that what I'm doing is serving the purpose of God in this life, and Jesus said, my soul is troubled, but what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause I came. I have a reason for being here. And then he knew his time was up. Now, I'm going to tell you again, guys, we live our dash. From the time you're born to the time you die, you got a dash. Live that dash. But within that dash, realize that God has done so much for you. He took your shame. He took your healing. I mean, he took your mental. There's so much in that book that will rescue you. Hallelujah. Time's up. Time's up. Time's up. Time's up. Let me say this to you. The time is up for you to quit playing games with God. The time's up for you to quit being so silly in life and goofy and letting things pass by you. I've had some sobering talks with my 17-year-old son since this. Son, the time is up for you to quit being this way I didn't say it like that I was a little more instructive time's up why you know when I look at it I realize it's t time's up to quit being it's time to get after my purpose in life heads bowed eyes closed father your gentle spirit moving through this place there's never been more kindness from a father than you through kindness, you saved us and loved us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, there's no greater power on this earth than the gospel. It's the good news. Lord, time's up for us to quit living our own ways, and doing our own thing. But it's time for us to take up a cross and follow you. To die to ourselves and live with this tension in our heart of abundant life here, but also knowing we'll be glorified there. And Lord, we want more than anything else to give you glory. If you understand right now that your time's up for foolishness and craziness, and it's time to start serving God and seeking your purpose, the His purpose in your generation, would you put your hand up? With the hands all over the building. Amen. Hold those hands up. That's good. Let us pray this together. Lord Jesus. I'm serious 
about giving up the old and pressing to the new. I understand that the dead man tries to resurrect. I will keep him down. I will press forward. I'll live my life for you. There's no greater opportunity or life I can have than to serve you in my generation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, bless him. Amen.